Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, oil and gas processing and uh, froth quality machine learning models. Uh, if those words don't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. We're going to be doing a good introduction to it. Uh, just before we get started, I'll do something. I'll do a little bit of an intro on myself. Uh, so my name is Jacob. I did my undergrad at the U of A in mechanical engineering. Uh, I did my master's down here at the UC in biomedical engineering, where I started getting into predictive analytics uh, to, uh, to help predict if someone's going to have a fracture in the future. And from there, uh, I kind of spun off and did an internship uh, at, a, um, at a machine learning consulting company. And, and now I've been with IBM for nine months. Uh, so yeah, so just um, drilling down a little bit further. Uh, ooh, that's a little bit hard to see. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, within, within the, uh, the oil sands process, uh, typically how the process goes is you'll have some, some sort of uh, shovel that digs the oil sands out of the ground, sticks it on some trucks, and there's some general processing that occurs where they mix in some water and they, and they try and separate out uh, the bitumen from, from the rest of the stuff, the minerals and the water. Uh, so what we were measuring in, in, this, in these models was froth quality. So it was actually the percentage of water and minerals in this process flow. So you want these to be as low as possible because you want as much uh, bitumen as possible. And so there were, so as Nancy mentioned, there were different thresholds that are, that the user had set saying that um, under 30% under, uh, water is, is an acceptable value or under 14% minerals is an acceptable value. Uh, and typically they would take action once they receive sort of two bad readings in a row. Uh, so, what, so the way we approach this model to, uh, to try and get some additional information on how we can predict these process upsets before they occur is by, uh, is by looking at sensor values from earlier on in the plant. So from process engineering knowledge, typical things that uh, you'd want to look for is the quality of the oil sands that you put through, that you put through your separation process, the volume of oil sands you put through there, and kind of the temperature of the entire flow. And we can get, and we can get ideas of these values by, by, examining sensor, by examining sensor data earlier on. So we can grab a whole bunch of sensors from the ore feed, hydro transport properties, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, when we, when we started to construct this kind of a model, we, we ran into our first challenge. So we have, we have all these sensor values that are coming in and we're trying to predict this one event. Uh, but the issue here is that these, the sensor values and the event are on completely different timescales. So we have our sensor values coming in at every five minutes. And these lab values, they're not just, first of all, they're like later down in the plant. And then we're looking at these 12 hour averaged lab values as well. So, uh, so the first way we thought of modeling this kind of a problem um, was by generating five-minute predictions on using these, uh, using these upstream sensors. So for every set of, of upstream sensors, you would plug it into some sort of machine learning model, you'd get a prediction, you'd get a whole bunch of those predictions, average it out over 12 hours, compare that to your ground truth, and, and kind of build a model from there. Um, typically, when you're trying to build a model, it's, it's a lot easier to, uh, to build your model when you, have, when you have ground truth a little bit more accessible. And so we found this a little bit difficult because there was an averaging step that also occurred in there, which made the math a lot more complicated. Uh, so for those of you that are more familiar with time series analysis, this was the second approach that, uh, that we took to represent this kind of a model. So, what we did is we took this block of sensor values over the last 12 hours. We took all of that and we just generated summary features from it. So we, so we took things like for a sensor over the last 12 hours, what's the mean, what's the, what's the standard deviation, what's the, what's the maximum, minimum, and we used those as our input features into the model. And using that, we could, we could get an estimate of if the next value is going to be good or off spec. And we can use that to compare against our ground truth. And we found this to be a much, um, this to have an improved performance. 
And while we were undergoing this process, we also found that uh, for uh, froth quality in particular, our previous value was, uh, was a significant predictor in our future value, so we included that as well and improved our predictions like that. So uh, the plot up here is an example of what um, an example of what things could be like. So the, so the black dots there would be every 12 hours, uh, an individual would go out, measure these froth quality values, and we could also have associated machine learning models where we kind of predict the risk of this going off spec two times in a row. And, uh, and with a model like this, where it's predicting every 12 hours and they're getting the data every 12 hours, we can kind of get a prediction at the same time as, as an upset. So that's not, that's not entirely useful. Uh, so what we tried to do here is we tried to take this model and actually break it up into five minute increments. So if we can run our machine learning model every five minutes, now we can start to get ahead of, ahead of these threshold based upsets so we can, yeah, so we can give our users some time to actually implement changes before, before they actually realize that these things have gone off spec. Uh, so while trying to well, so while trying to convert uh, our model from a 12-hour base instance to kind of running it every five minutes, the challenge we ran into here was was the use of that previous value. So the way we trained the model, every previous value was exactly 12 hours before before our currently predicted value. But once we start running it every five minutes, now it's going to be a time difference of 12 hours and five minutes, 12 hours and 10 minutes, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what we noticed is that would that would cause our model to be quite erratic and jumpy because once we got an update on that previous value, it would, it would kind of shift the entire, the entire predictions by a lot. So we thought about how we, could, how we could get some sort of value in the middle of these 12-hour of these measures. And some ways we could do it uh, are by forward filling the data where we just have the previous value just repeated over and over and over until we get a new value backfilling the data, taking the new value and kind of um, filling it backwards over and over and over, or just doing some sort of like interpolation between the values to get an idea of what's going on. Uh, so we tried, these, we tried these approaches, and I think the, and I think the fundamental problem here was that uh, you weren't, we weren't getting information from the sensors upstream of the plant like we were from our previous froth quality, uh, from our previous froth quality value. And also, we don't necessarily, when we're running this in our, um, when we're running this live, we don't necessarily know what that next prediction is. So that interpolation value or that, or that backfilling value, it's gonna be a guess at best. So knowing that, we, uh, we changed the approach that we used to this, and, and we thought about why, why the previous value was, uh, what kind of information the previous value was actually giving the model. So since the previous froth quality value is dependent on these upstream sensors, uh, what we thought was we can, actually, we can actually get an idea of if anything odd is happening in the sensors upstream by, by doing some dimensionality reduction. Uh, so uh, for, uh, for those of you unfamiliar, dimensionality reduction just takes, um, it takes high dimensional data sets. So uh, for example, the, this vast number of sensors, and what it does is it it looks at the variation within all of those within all of that data and tries to and tries to approximate that variation using a less number of features. So, uh, so there was a few different algorithms that we tried out. Um, we tried out principal component analysis. We tried out factor analysis. We tried out uh, some auto encoders, and uh, and what worked out best for us was always oh, principal components analysis. So then the new way the model kind of looked is uh, we still had that previous 12 hours of data that was feeding our prediction, but then for the 12 hours prior to that, we were just running uh, these PCA values to generate that feature surrogate to add into that prediction. So now this was, this was a, a pretty fundamental breakthrough in our model because now we can actually move this into like the five minute prediction space. And fortunately enough, we saw that um, we saw that when we, when we trained these models, they still performed quite similarly to, uh, to when they were having those previous predictions. So that, that kind of gives us an indication that using this dimensionality reduction approach was, was useful and was capturing the right kind of information. And so 
And so with the diagram up on the screen here, we have that same example that we had before, but instead of running it every 12 hours, now we can see every five minutes, and, uh, and now we can get ahead of the threshold-based predictions, and we could let our user know hours ahead of the fact that there was going to be a process upset in this specific area, which allowed them to take advantage of that and actually, and actually implement uh, different kinds of mitigation strategies. Uh, yeah, it's not currently implemented in, in this solution, but there are, there are um, interesting ways that, that you could get the why. Um, for example, uh, SHAP values are, um, are pretty interesting. They're state-of-the-art techniques that uh, they look for the, they look and see like within specific, uh, specific predictions what uh, what positively weighed towards that outcome and what negatively weighed towards that outcome. And you can use that to kind of uh, get, an, get a better understanding of what is actually happening behind the black box. Uh, we kept a track of them when we were developing the model and then as, as it's implemented as well. Uh, so, there, so yeah, it was, it was a pretty rare event and, like, uh, and to accommodate for that, we had to, uh, we did some uh, imbalance sampling. So we uh, subsampled the uh, the amount of times when times were good, so that we ended up, so that our models themselves ended up with a more balanced data set. Uh, we received we received data that they had already been that they had already been uh, acquiring. Uh, yeah, so we used uh, yeah, so we had used the data from the past to uh, to build the models and train the models, and then and then we ran it on the ongoing data. I hope that answers your question. Okay, perfect. Uh, you, that's, that's definitely an interesting approach. Um, I, I don't think we ended up using it. We definitely talked about it, but, uh, but yeah, we, we didn't end up using it because we got, uh, we got acceptable values from, from just alternative approaches. And, and then also, I guess one of the things with, uh, with these models is uh, there was definitely a, a time constraint as well on how, on how quickly our client wanted it turned around. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we get we get good results quickly before we yeah before we try something else. But that's absolutely an interesting approach. Mm -hmm. um, as part of so this is uh, so these were uh, one set of models because we did qualities for water and minerals. Uh, this, these were one set of models amongst a larger project, and and amongst the larger project we we actually had to we had to do some analysis to figure out. Uh, that those time lags and and how long that generally took. Um, one of the interesting things was, uh, I guess, depending uh, using the twelve hour using the twelve hour window and our summary statistics, we uh, we saw that it didn't make too much of a difference. But yeah, but if it was a, a smaller time frame, it would absolutely have to be like certain sensors would have to be lagged differently to to capture the right windows of data.